Think you know about EKGs, huh? Well, what about this one, or this one, or this, this, this? Hello everyone, my name is Mario Martinez, and this is Amateur EMS. So today we're going to be going over heart blocks. This is going to be my fifth video on a playlist going over EKG interpretations. If you get confused during this one, I'd highly recommend clicking the playlist on my channel and heading over to the EKG section. Building a strong foundation is always the best approach. But with that being said, these are the four main types of heart blocks that we need to know at least in the ALS level. So the four main types are a first degree AV block, a second degree type one block, also known as a Weckenbach, I think I pronounced that right, a second degree type two heart block, and a third degree AV heart block. There are technically other blocks or like escape rhythms, like we can look at like a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block. We covered it a little bit previously on how to identify it in the last video, but we're just gonna go ahead and move on and focus more so on AV blocks. If we remember from our rules of interpretation video, rule number two talks about the PR interval being less than 0.2 seconds or one big box. Rule number three talks about how many P waves are present. Are there more than one? And rule number five discusses about do the P waves and the QRS complexes match each other? Do the P waves match with the P waves? Do the QRS complexes match with the QRS complexes? These three rules are gonna be essential when interpreting heart blocks, so make sure to keep them in mind. Here we can see an example of a first degree heart block, and if you could take a look, we wanna identify the PR interval, so we're gonna take a look at these different waves and the P waves here, and we're gonna to try to find one that matches up with the line right here. So if we look over here, we can see that the P wave matches up right about here at the beginning of the PR interval. And if we look at one of our big red boxes here, we can see that it takes more than one big red box, almost like one and a half. So I'd say about 0.32 seconds between this PR interval right here. So if we can remember, that's going to break rule two, where the PR interval should not be greater than 0.2 seconds. We do need to ask about the other rules though. So rule number three talks about how many P waves are present and it looks like there's one P wave for every QRS complex. Also, the P waves match with the P waves, and they match with the QRS complex. They're about the same distance every single time. So all of that looks good. It's just rule two that is broken for this one. So a first degree AV block is the mildest form of a heart block. We need to remember from earlier that the AV node is responsible for delaying the electrical signal between the atria and the ventricles. This delay allows the atria to fully contract and to fill the ventricles with blood before the ventricles contract and pump blood towards the body or to the lungs. In a first degree heart block, there's just a slight delay in this conduction, but it doesn't prevent the signal from getting through. It's just slower than normal, and that's why we see on an EKG, they have a PR interval greater than 0.2 seconds. Usually for patients like this, they may be asymptomatic, and it's often caused by things like a vagal tone issue, medications, or ischemic heart disease. The rhythm is still regular and all atrial impulses are conducted through the ventricles, but they are delayed. So again, if we look at this, so if we look at this, we can see that they have a prolonged PR interval. That's because it's just slightly delayed. Now let's go ahead and talk about a second degree type one AV block, also known as a Weckenbach, which I may be saying wrong. This is a little bit more complex. We have a progressive delay in the conduction of electrical signals through the AV node, and eventually one of the impulses is gonna be completely blocked. So we'll see eventually a drop beat. So if we look over here at the EKG, we can see that we have our P wave here, our QRS complex here. We can see that there's a slight delay, but if you look, our PR interval is slowly progressing and getting bigger. So our PR interval is greater than 0.2 seconds in some of our leads, not all of them. At the same time, we have one P wave, one QRS, but let's keep looking at this rhythm. So we have this continuing increase in our PR interval, and then eventually we drop a QRS complex completely right here. So we need to look at the PR interval. It's greater than 0.2 seconds in some of our rhythms. At the same time, we have more than one P wave in some of the sections right here. So right here, we have a P wave here, a P wave here. Does the QRS match up with the QRS? No because we're missing a spot right here. Does the P wave match with the P wave? Yes, it does. And being able to differentiate that the P wave is not staying aligned with the QRS complex right here. So even though these may match together, they don't match with the QRS complex. And we have that widening gap here. And sometimes we'll have a second P wave right here. That can kind of show us and lead us towards, okay, this is gonna be a second degree type one heart block. 
If the P wave were to match up closer to the QRS complex, we're going to see that that'll more so match up with a type 2 degree heart block. So for a second degree AV block type 1, the PR interval starts out normal, but with each successive beat, it gets longer and longer. Eventually, a PR interval is going to get so long that the impulse is blocked, and so a QRS complex is dropped. After the drop beat, the cycle will start over again with the normal PR interval, followed by the progressive lengthening and then another drop beat. So it breaks rule two, it breaks rule three, and it breaks part of rule five. But in certain ways, it helps us differentiate between a type one and a type two heart block. So a Weckenbach is typically caused by vagal tone, ischemia, or medications, and they can often be self-limiting. In some cases though, it can progress to a more serious type of block. So it's something that we need to monitor closely. We may need to consider treatments such as like atropine or a temporary pacemaker or a cardiac pacing depending on if the patient is symptomatic or not. Next, let's talk about a second degree type two AV block, also known as a Mobitz type two. This type is much more dangerous and often requires immediate intervention. In a second degree type two AV block, we don't see the progressive PR interval lengthening that we saw in a type one second degree AV block. Instead, there's a sudden unexpected failure of the conduction. The PR interval remains constant, but some atrial impulses will simply not make it through the AV node to the ventricles, resulting in a dropped QRS complex. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So we can see here, we have our P wave. It matches up with the QRS complex, right? So we like to see that. Our PR interval is less than 0.2 seconds. We're going through this. This all looks great. This looks great. But look, this here breaks one of our rules where there's more than one P wave. We can also look, we can see that this goes ahead and it matches up, but our P wave will have a dropped QRS complex where normally you can see the QRS complexes match with each other, then suddenly this is gone. And then we have another QRS complex. So what's really going on is one of our ventricles just aren't contracting on one of these beats. So we have a P wave, these match up as well. So that looks good, but we're missing our QRS complex here. The big significant change is if we look at a second degree type two heart block and a second degree type one heart block, as we can see that the P wave matches up with the QRS complex, but occasionally there's an extra P wave. If we go backwards here, if we look at our P waves, sometimes we have two P waves, but we can see that there's a lengthened PR interval, and then we have the occasional drop QRS complex like over here. So some key features, the PR interval is usually normal and consistent. Occasionally, one or more of the P waves will not be conducted to the ventricles and we'll see a dropped QRS complex. The rhythm is usually regular except for the drop beats. So for rule number two, the PR interval is constant but still longer than normal in some cases. Rule number three, there are extra P waves. The atria are still firing regularly, but the signal is not making it to the ventricles. Rule number five, the P waves and the QRS complexes are no longer synchronized. A second degree type two heart block is often due to a structural problem in the AV node or the his per kunji system. It can also be caused by things like ischemic heart disease, myocardial infarction, or fibrosis of the conduction pathways. The treatment, Mobitz types two, is much more dangerous because it has a higher likelihood of progressing to a third degree heart block. The treatment typically involves temporary pacing to manage the heart rate until more definitive treatment can be administered. A permanent pacemaker is often required in the long term to prevent reoccurrence. So we can't treat this AV block with atropine. Instead, we need to move straight over to pacing if they're symptomatic. Finally, let's talk about third degree AV blocks, also known as a complete heart block. This is the most severe form of a heart block and involves a complete failure of communication between the atriums and the ventricles. In this case, the SA node continues to fire and stimulate the atriums, but the AV node is completely blocked and there's no signals reaching the ventricles. Here's an example of an EKG. And what's really interesting about it is we can see there are multiple P waves. We have our QRS complex, but we can see that the PR interval, sometimes it's wide, sometimes it's short. So what's going on? Are we thinking that it's second degree type one, a second degree type two? But if we look, and what's really interesting is the P waves aren't really matching up with the QRSs at all. But if we look, the QRSs, they match up with each other. They're the same length. If you want to count the boxes, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is a really friendly EKG where we can look at the lines here, right? And if we look, the P wave looks like it's matching with each P wave here. 
So the QRS complexes are matching with each other. The P waves continuously match with each other. And if you look right here, from this P wave to over here, it looks like the P wave is almost enveloped with the T wave. So while the ventricles are relaxing or getting ready to fill back up with blood, the P wave is actually contracting and pushing blood towards the ventricle, noticed by the P wave. So we have this disorganized rhythm here, but at the same time, there's a level of organization where the P wave fires off at the same time and the QRS complexes fire off at the same time. Here we have another third degree heart block and we can see sometimes the P wave will be less than 0.2 seconds and then sometimes it'll be greater than 0.2 seconds. We can see we have multiple P waves here. And again, what's really interesting is if we look at the QRS complexes, and usually you want to start somewhere where there's a line, we can count the amount of boxes we have here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and a half, and then a half, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the QRS complex, they look like they're matching up, which is great. This one's a little bit depleted, but that's okay. And then we have our P waves. Now our P waves are matching. So if we look right, if I'm looking over here, I might decide to use a P wave such as, we'll go with this one here. And then we have one box, two box, three boxes, something like that. And then if we look here, we have about one box, two box, three boxes. So they match up. And we have our P wave, our P wave, our P wave. Where's our P wave here? Well, it's actually enveloped in the T wave right here. And that's why we have this weird deformity. If we look again, we have a P wave. Where's our next P wave at? Well, this QRS just looks a little bit different from the other QRS complexes. It may be that the P wave is missing somewhere in the QRS complex. And we know that the ventricles contract a lot harder than the atriums contract. So generally, it's going to envelop the contraction of the P wave. So we can see here it's missing. And we have another P wave, a P wave. It's enveloped by the T wave again, again, and again. So extremely cool a rhythm to look at. So there are some things to note for third degree heart blocks. The P waves and the QRS complexes are completely dissociated from each other. The atria and the ventricles are no longer synchronized. The ventricular rate is typically much slower than the atrial rate as the ventricles are being paced by a secondary pacemaker, such as the Hiss and the Purkinje system. This is known as an escape rhythm and it's something we talked about in the last video. The rate is usually around 20 to 40 beats per minute and it's much slower than normal. What I mean by that is if we look at a rhythm, you can see that these beats are really spaced out, but if we were just using the P waves, we'd have a whole different heart rate. So if they did match with the QRS complex, we'd have a almost like twice as fast or almost three times as fast heart rate compared to this very slow QRS complex that are being formed. Now, some key features, we're gonna see a complete dissociation again with the P waves and the QRS complexes. The ventricular rate is slow because it's an escape rhythm. There's no conduction from the atria to the ventricles and a third degree heart block for treatment requires immediate intervention because it can lead to severe bradycardia and inadequate perfusion of the body. The patient may need a temporary pacemaker to stabilize this rhythm until a permanent pacemaker can be implanted. So if it's left untreated, a third degree heart block can progress to cardiac arrest. So for these type of patients, atropine isn't going to work. We need to move straight over to pacing. So quick summary, everybody, for a first degree heart block, it has a mild delay and is generally an asymptomatic patient. For a second degree type one heart block, it's a progressive delay with occasional drop beats or drop QRS complexes. For a second degree type two heart block, it's gonna have sudden QRS complex drops and it's often going to require intervention. And a third degree heart block is going to be a complete dissociation. We definitely don't want this and it requires urgent treatment. Recognizing each type and taking appropriate action is crucial as an ALS provider. Some quick special notes. Atropine should be heavily considered depending on your local protocols for a first degree type 1 and a second degree type 1 heart block. Unless they are hemodynamically unstable, meaning they have like an altered mental status, their vital signs are bad, they're hypotensive, they're confused, things like that, then we want to consider going to pacing. However, Pacing should be considered for second degree type 2 heart blocks and third degree heart blocks. We don't want to mess with atropine because it's not going to be effective. We want to move straight to pacing if we deem it that it's necessary for our patient. So thank you guys for watching. Understanding heart blocks is crucial in EMS and ALS support. Each type has unique EKG features and treatments needed. Be sure to review the EKG playlist for more on EKG interpretations. We're getting to a really fun part, guys. I'm really excited. We need to go over AFib and atrial flutter next. We need to go over some junctional rhythms. But guys, we're getting to the point. 
where we're just going to start pumping out these videos where I'm going to be having like five or 10 EKG rhythms. And I'm going to say, what do you guys think it is? And then we're going to interpret it together. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be kind of like a test made for test for you guys later on in life or for any studying that you're doing. So I'm really excited. Thank you guys so much, by the way, for the 2000 subscribers. It's amazing. I am overwhelmed with gratitude and I'm trying to reply to each comment as much as I can. It's kind of hard though. I'm trying to type out a lengthy response, not just doing like a generic thank you for every single one of them. I am reading all of them or as much as I can. It's, it's pretty hard to keep up with, but I am extremely thankful. If you guys have any questions, please leave a comment. I will do my best to comment back and I will see you on the next one. Thank you.